so. Guys, welcome to the last combinatorics lecture. So it's, you know, therefore the last interesting one that anyone would ever want to consider being involved in. So, first up, did anyone solve my Ramsey theory question from yesterday? No one? Okay, should I spoil it? Okay, cool. So, what do you do? Can you you the first observe. Sorry? What's the problem? Ah, yes. Okay, so you have a coloring with countably on okay, coloring with countably many uh, colors over the complete graph on uh, the real numbers. Okay, so for every pair of reals you have an edge and you assign a color to it. Can and can you avoid a monochrome triangle? Okay, and the answer is yes. Yes, you can. Yes? Uh, KR are the real numbers. Thanks. That pair? Um, Sorry, but what is the. Can you describe what we're working with? We said coloring. So. A grid, a grid of. No, so for, for every edge between oh, two. What? So you draw an edge between every two real numbers. Okay. And you color it either color one, color two, color three, up to color eight. Well, up, out to infinity. But countable infinity. Okay? And you lose if there is a triangle which is all color 78, or all color one, or all color 92, you get the idea. Okay? So the first thing you want to do is you map R to the open interval 0, 1. Mm -hmm. Okay? You can do that. Yes. Take octan of pi by 2 or something. Great. So now we're going to deal with K 0, 1 instead of KR. Okay? So we are going to color. A, B by first all right so you you write all your numbers in binary and they're all infinite sequences of 0 and 1. And because they're different numbers, eventually some digits will be different. Now, this there's a mild technicality here that some numbers have more than one binary expansion. A half is 0 0.1, and it's also 0 0.0111111. Just take one that's 0 eventually. Um, so, for example, 0 0.2 is 0 0.001 something, and 0 0.4 is 0 0.01 something, so the edge between these will be of color 2. Okay, everyone understand the color? Okay, now can this have a monochromatic triangle? No. 
because if A and B are color K, they first differ in position K, right? So without loss of generality, this will have a zero at K, and this can have a one at K, right? Cool. Now, imagining that we have K on both of these, oh, well, it differs over there, so it must be zero at K. It differs over there, so it must be a one at K, and contradiction. Any questions? No. That was Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Cool. So yeah, that problem is a uh, fun one to do. Okay, so you guys just wrote um, advanced test four. What do you guys think of question five? Down, up, up, up. Okay, so I'm going to share a solution to it. <laughs> so, turns out the answer is two inches in, you choose all the subsets of size n. Okay, and then it'll probably get a mark or two, and now we have to... <laughs> wow, okay. And now we have to prove it, which is where all the rest of the marks are. So here's the proof. Okay. There are two in factorial terms. Okay. Two in factorial permutations. Okay, so write out any permutation you like. Four, three, one, two, six, five. Okay, and you can draw a line and take the subset to the left. Right? Now, for every permutation, you can draw exactly one line because if you draw two, you now have a subset of another subset and you break the condition, right? <coughs> okay. So let's look at a particular permutation. A1, A2, dot, 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 AK. K plus 1, dot, 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 A2N. Right? If I draw this line here, and I take A1 through AK, how many permutations have I used up? How many of the two in factorial permutations have I used up? Well, I could reorder those in any way I like, and I'd still get the same subset. So choosing this subset takes k factorial, two in minus k factorial permutations away, right? What's the cheapest way to do this? This only depends on k and a little bit of either calculus or just taking ratios between consecutive ones will get you n factorial, n factorial is the cheapest, you know, get rid of the fewest permutations. And you want to use all permutations, right? So, turns out you can, using for the low, low price of n factorial squared permutations, you can get a subset, okay? So if you're trying to be greedy, this is the best thing you could possibly hope for. Oh, and you keep doing it until you use up all of them. So therefore, taking all the n element subsets is the absolute best you can do. Questions? It's not an easy problem. Okay, so you would say your final answer is taking all of n elements? All element subsets, yeah. Um, they'll mention that, you know, like most of these proofs, most of these questions, you know, the points aren't in and the point isn't the answer, it's the proof and the solution. 
Okay, so now let's go back to our discussion of game theory. Who's heard of a true? I have. Okay, heard of a true? No one else heard of a true? Okay, you guys know what a duel is, right? Two people go out to kill each other, and if you're using a gun tool from a certain time period, I take my shot, and either I kill you, sorry, Gawa, or I miss, and then you take your shot at me, and possibly you kill me. If not, I take my shot at you, and we just keep doing this. Okay? Everyone familiar with that idea? Okay, so Trull turns out to be there are three people who really just want to kill each other. Okay, and the semi natural generalization. Elf walks up, he shoots either at Bob or Carl, and if he hits one, well, they're dead. But after he takes a shot, the gun gets handed over to Bob, or he takes out his own gun, <coughs> and if he's still alive, he gets his turn to shoot. Then it's the only one gun. Everyone is well, they, they take turns shooting is the point. And <coughs> Bob. Yeah, yeah. They're, they get as many shots as they need until there is only one. Okay, but Elf takes a shot. Bob, if he's still alive, takes a shot. Then Carl, if he's still alive, takes a shot. Elf, if he's still alive, takes a shot. And so on. Now. This is a famous problem of three particular duelists who are called Mr. Black, who with probability one out of three hits his target. Oh, and if you hit, you die. Like, there's no like launching blows in this particular problem. Mr. Gray, two out of three. He shoots at you, he's got a two out of three chance of hitting. And then Mr. White, he kills whatever he aims at, he kills. So? Okay, cool. Um, so he's dangerous. So these three decide, okay, cool. We don't like each other. We're going to agree to fight to the death over it. And to make things fair, Mr. Black will shoot first, followed by Mr. Gray, then Mr. White. Now you find yourself in the position of being Mr. Black. Should have practiced shooting more. Who do you shoot? What's your optimal strategy? And perhaps we'll even work out the probability of victory. Anyone? Who do you want to kill? Come on. And? Okay, um, so basically, if you don't, if you don't kill. Uh, White, yeah. Then you'll just like shoot you and die. So just yeah. So if you shoot, if you shoot Mr. Gray, you hit him. Ha! I got one. And now the perfect shot is aiming at you. So shooting Mr. Gray is a terrible idea. So you shoot him, Mr. White. Okay. So that is the sensible answer. And here's the trick. You miss. Okay? Well, you might miss. You've got two thirds chance. And if you miss, Gray, well, he's looking at you. You're not that much of a threat. So he'll shoot at White. And if he happens to miss, White will shoot at him instead of you because, well, come on, you're again less of a threat. So the answer is missing works out kind of well for you. You should aim to miss. <laughs> okay, so bang. And now these guys are aiming at each other. Okay, so if you miss, let's work out the probability of survival. So with a two out of three chance, okay, you miss, gray shoots of white. Three out of two chance, jewel, gray, first. You dual gray and you get the first shot. And with probability one out of three, dual white. Okay, because this is the case where you shoot the ground, gray aims at white, he misses, white shoots him. Now, you still have to dual Mr. White, so that's kind of awful, but you get the first shot. 
right? This, this is different. Right? This is better than you have to do on Mr. White and he gets the first shot where he mm -hmm. just instantly kills you. Okay, so Joe White and you get the first shot. This is a 1 over 3 event. So here you get a probability of 1 over 9 of winning in this way. Okay, what about uh, if you get a shot at Mr. the first shot at Mr. Gray? Well, there's a 1 out of 3 chance to kill him. Right? The first shot. Or maybe you miss. That's turn of 3. Followed by, hey, he misses, it happens. And then you get him. Right? Or that could happen twice, right? I shoot, I miss, he misses, I miss again, he misses, bang, I get him. Uh, squared, time to third, and this is a geometric series, which is a third times by one over one minus this common ratio of two ninths. <coughs> so seven ninths, nine sevenths, Sevenths is uh, three sevenths times that two thirds gives us a probability of two sevenths. Right? Um, try. Oh, oh, I can. And you know, this is better than the third. You've got a pretty good, you know, this is a better chance of winning than just if you were a random guy, even though you are this pathetic worth of shot. Okay, and there's a natural extension to this, which I think might be open, partly because I don't think too many people care. I have N players, and the I player hits with probability I over K. And they shoot in this order. And you know what strategy should he employ in this sort of in player game? I don't know. I don't think anyone else does. If you want to work on it, Tay simulations might do something quite a lot. Yes, speak to me if you do. Ah. So now I'm going to tell you about something called the Thousand Islanders problem. You might have heard of it, but I'm going to tell you a extension. One sec. Get into that. An extension which me, my advisor, and another two great students, one of whom had an IMO silver medal for Singapore, and the advisor had a what a fellow at some point. We spent like two hours arguing about this. Well, this poor Matt by a guy who was our invited speaker kind of just sat there quietly feeling progressively more uncomfortable. It was great. Oh. Mm. Yeah, I think I'm actually just going to speak it. So, you have a thousand people who live on an island in a world where everyone has either blue eyes or brown eyes. Okay, there are no green-eyed people, no purple eyes, no red-eyed, no pink eyes, and so on. Everyone's blue-eyed or brown-eyed. But they have a weird religion where if you find out your own eye colour, you have to kill yourself at noon the next day in the town square. Okay? And they all agree that, and that they all do this. Now one day a stranger comes to town, and they're not used to strangers, so they give him a feast. And he gets drunk and accidentally blurts out, by the way, there are no mirrors here, because they would just, you know, that's a gun. So, the stranger blurts out and not knowing the law or drunk or something. You know, it's so interesting to see blue-eyed people in this part of the world, and wanders off. Now, as it happens, a hundred of these thousands of blue eyes, 900 have brown eyes. And we're going to talk about what happens. And we're going to talk about 
two arguments and find out what's wrong with one of them. So the first argument is everyone knew there were blue eyes, right? You see nine, if you're blue-eyed, you see 900 brown-eyed people and 99 blue-eyed people every day. If you're brown-eyed, you see 899 brown-eyed people and 100 blue-eyed people every day. So everyone knew there were blue eyes. He hasn't told us anything new. Nothing needs to change, right? Now there's another argument, which is an inductive one. Oh, by the way, we everyone can assume that these are all perfect logicians who never make any mistakes whatsoever. If there was one blue-eyed person, he'd find out something. He'd kill himself the next day, right? Now, if there are two blue-eyed people. Both of them kind of look at the other guy and go, yeah, he's killing himself tomorrow. And then he doesn't, so both of them have to kill themselves. On day two, not on day one. Okay, so this day notion is very much something that introduces a common way for us to all measure steps. What if there are three blind people? Well, on every one of them is expecting the other guy to kill himself on the other two to kill themselves on day two. But on day two they don't. So on day three they will realize, oh gee, I guess I'm also blue-eyed. Okay, so we build up this induction and on day 100 all 100 blue-eyed people kill themselves. And coincidentally on day 101 all brown-eyed people kill themselves. Right, because now you found that out. So the question is, which of these arguments is right? And why is the wrong one wrong? Anyone have any ideas? I mean, don't you have sort of an exponential effect? Mm -hmm. Why is it just one each day? Um, well, that's sort of what you can argue, right? If you have... Um, and it's because the argument's inductive. So if you have one person, well, they, they'll realize it. But because one person would realize it, you know, the guy who's, if they're two blind people, one of them will think, gee, you know, he might be the only blue-eyed person. If he is, he'll kill himself. But if I'm also blue-eyed, then on day two we have to kill ourselves together. Right? Or if he doesn't kill himself on day two, then, oh, gee, he mustn't think he's the only blue-eyed person. He knew there was someone blue-eyed. And I guess that, or and, you know, and oh, look into a mirror and see no, no, and there are no mirrors. Mirrors are suicide. No. Uh, what do you see? Yeah. Do, sorry, do they just to go back to the basics? Do they know that there are a hundred blue eyes? Mm, well, no. They, they don't know those. Details. If they knew that there were a hundred blue eyes on the first day, everyone would kill themselves. Yeah. Because the blue eye, the ninety-nine, the blue-eyed people would look. They'd see ninety-nine blue-eyed people, and they'd realize, geez, I must be number one hundred. And the brown-eyed people would look at 100 blue-eyed people and go, gee, I must not be one of them, I'm brown-eyed. Okay? You guys all happy with this? Okay, so which argument is wrong and why? John? The learning information arguments is wrong. Mm -hmm. Because I saw this on a Riddle website and I used the other one. So they put on this. <laughs> Okay, so in that case, what new information has been added? No, 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 no. The, the new information is wrong. They will all put themselves down. Right, right. But then the, the guy who's arguing there's no new information is somehow wrong. What new information is added? Andy? Isn't it something like the inductive one is wrong because you use induction, but one of the cases of the base case doesn't hold or something like that? There are problems like that. Um, which base case? Okay, so I'm going to let um, there be a little bit more discussion on this. Yes, you guys are going to have to talk to each other. I'm sorry. Is that a hand? Yes. Uh, the guy had, did add new information. So what new information? He added the, so people knew that there was blue eyed people already, right? Yes. Because I could see them. Yes. Uh, what they didn't know was that everybody else knew everyone else's color, eye color, and everybody else knew that everybody else knew 
that's the right idea. So yeah, so imagine there is only one blue-eyed person. And that will not everyone knows, right? Like the blue-eyed guy does not know that there's anyone with a blue eye. Now in the world where there are two blue-eyed people, very importantly, <coughs> they both know this blue-eyed person, right? Let's say there are two people, oh, and Ed Kehello have blue eyes. Um, okay, both Andy, Andy sees Kehello, he sees, oh, there's another blue eyed person. Kehello sees Andy, he sees there's another blue eyed person. But if you ask Kehello, does Andy know there's a blue eyed person? He wouldn't have thought, he'd go, well, I don't know, maybe. But now, when this person speaks and says there's a blue eyed person, he adds, in the two person case, the information that everyone knows there's a blue-eyed person. And in the three-person case, it's, it's that everyone knows that everyone knows that there's a blue-eyed person. And in this hundred-person case, it's I know that you know that I know that you know a hundred times that there's a blue-eyed person. Okay, and this is a notion called common information, which um, if you read Winning Ways by John Conway, uh, you'll hear him you know, talk about. It. It's called um, Oh, that. Yeah. Okay, so here is a. Uh, so that's all well and good. Here's an extension problem. Well, here's the extension. Now, imagine that you know the stranger comes to town. There are hundred blue-eyed people. And he says what he says, and everyone is, you know, all torn apart that, you know, we're all going to die in 100 days. Someone else is 101. So what if someone just goes, I can't take it anymore, and kills themselves anyway? Can disaster be averted? Escape the um, well, you know, everyone dying. If someone does it from a, a, a blue eyed person, does it first there? No. Mm -hmm. Can multiple people? Yeah, multiple people can work can. together to try and avoid disaster. Yeah, or you know, even someone can go around and say to people, here's a mirror, here's a mirror, here's a mirror. <laughs> um, there are many ways that you can make this. Um, that you can precipitate the early killings. Um, let's see. So, Farah. I'm guessing disaster can't be averted, and I'm still trying to work out how exactly to phrase it. Okay, so should I leave this as a thing to think about? No. Okay, so I just drop the answer then. So it turns out what you need is you need K blue eyed people to kill themselves by day K for some K, and then everyone else can go, cool. Interestingly, in this case, uh, the brown eyed people never have to kill themselves. Imagine you get to day 100, no one has done the noble thing and sacrificed themselves. Okay, the blue eyed people figure out, shit, I've got blue eyes, <laughs> and they all kill themselves. Right? So every one of those 101 browner people could go, maybe all 100 of them just coincidentally decided to kill themselves on day 100. Right? Just one day early. I guess I don't have to kill myself. I might, if I might still have blue eyes. Okay, very, 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 very unlikely, but logically possible. Right? So the browner people can avoid death, yeah, that's the first observation. And it turns out that if K blue-eyed people kill themselves by day K, 
then your induction argument breaks. And I think I'm going to leave the details of that for a little bit because I want to show you something called the gambler's room. Sorry? I want to show you something called a uh, gambler's room. So here's the game. We have two players, and they have a bunch of coins. They each have a pile of coins. Okay? And they're going to play a game. Where they have a token. Okay. T token coin. And they flip it. If it's heads, this player gives a coin to this player. If it's tails, that player gives a coin to that player. Right? They start with K coins and N minus K coins. And here's a question Who's going to win? Or what's the probability that the player with K coins wins? How do you win? You win by getting all the other person's coins. Ah, okay. If you win by having heads or something like that. Well, you win a particular role by having heads, and the other guy wins by having tails. But if I win, I take a coin of yours. The only way I truly win is by taking every, by getting the last coin before you get mine. So. Surely the one with more coins is going to win. The one with more coins is more likely to win. Yeah. But how much more likely? Right, it's just possible that I could have one coin, you have 99, and I get 99 hits by, you know, with some chance. Mm -hmm. But over a, if you play the game indefinitely? If you play, well, you don't play it indefinitely, you play until someone gets all the coins. Um, yeah, you're quite right that at some point it's quite likely that I'll, you know, if you have more points, you're far more likely to win. But, you know, we're trying to figure out what the function is. Obviously, this game could go on a very long time. It could, and we're going to work out exactly how long it goes on an average for. Is the probability of winning the same? Yeah, so we'll start with a 50 50 coin. Do you want to know the expected winning player? I want to know the probability of player one winning. Okay. And the guy with K coins, out of a possible N, what's his probability of winning? Anyone have any ideas? Well, it turns out there are a bunch of related problems here. There's the probability of winning with zero coins, that's zero. The probability of winning with one coin. We'll call that P1. Um, probability of one with two coins is P2, and so on, up to probability of one with n coins is 1. Okay, everyone like that notation? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if I have k coins, my probability of victory is a half times p right because I'm going to flip half the time I'll lose and go to pk minus one and half the time I'll win and go to pk plus one right yeah everyone everyone happy with this coin <coughs> so now we can do Eek geometry. Um, Sorry, define P again. Sorry, P PI again. is the probability of the winning eventually of eventually winning if you start with I of the N coins. And so P1, P2, and PN are all one. No, no, PN is one, P0 is zero. Right, because if you have N coins, you've won. If you have zero coins, you've lost. So, for example, P1 is a half times P0, okay, which is naught. 
plus a half times P2. Uh, P1 is a half P2. P2 is twice P1. Right? Okay, and P2 is a half P1 plus a half P3. Algebra. P3 is 3P1. And in fact, inductively, P2 will to P1. And you can go through this algebra if you want. The other way to see it is to say, well, PK is right between PK minus 1 and PK plus 1. This has to be linear. And we know PN is 1, therefore, PK works out to be in K over N. So if I've got 30 coins and you've got 70 coins, my probability of winning is? Yes, okay. That's kind of nice. Yeah. Um, now, this game has, has been noted, it could go on for a while, right? So let's work out the, how long on average we expect it to take. Okay, well, let's call it, it's going to take t, k, t of k steps from a position where I have k coins, right? We, we can talk about this, yes? Okay, so what do we know? t0 is 0 and tn is 0, right? And we also have TK. I'm going to make a move. Okay, this is going to be K to up to N minus 1. Why is TZ and TN 0? Is that in the beginning? How long is it going to take it to end if you have zero coins? Now, if you have zero coins, the game's over. Okay. Um, but TN is also zero coins. Yeah. Because the other person has zero if you have all the coins, if you've got n coins, you've got all the coins you've won. So, okay, and we get this equation. And now it's kind of a bunch of algebra to figure things out, to figure out what the expected time is, right? So I don't quite understand. So TK equals is that one? One. Yeah. So if I've got k coins, well, first I'm going to make a move. We play. I either half the time we're going to get one half the weight, and another on average k t of k minus one steps. And the other half the time, I'm going to have to move to k plus one coins and do this and you know, progress like that. Mm. All right. So there's a bit of algebra here, and. What time do we finish? 12.30? Because we're running a little bit late today. Okay, in the interest of time, it turns out that TK is K times K minus N. Uh, yes, K times N minus K. That makes sense because by symmetry, TK should equal T N minus K. Is that the explicit solution to yep. the difference equation? That is, yes. Um, and by playing around with it, it's sort of not that bad to get to. Um, but there is another way of getting to these things, which uses a thing called the martingale sapi theorem. Yes? The, the average waiting time until you, until you win. What number of steps? So yeah, number of steps. Time steps. Yeah, the, the expected number of time steps. Okay. So, a martingale 
is something that you expect. So Martingale is something that at every time step chain you expect to change to zero. Okay? Okay, so in this setup, you're as likely to win a coin as to lose a coin, right? So your expected number of coins on average is not changing step to step, right? Okay, so therefore, there's a theorem that no matter what rule we have for stopping, your average fortune won't change. That's called the Monegale Stopping Theorem, which I'm going to use and not prove right now. Okay, so expectation of your fortune at time zero is expectation of your fortune at time tau, which is your when you end. Okay, your fortune at time zero is k, which is equal to your fortune when you stop. What's your fortune when you stop? It's the probability you lose times zero plus p win times n. And therefore probability of winning is k of rain. Okay, so this is a whole lot less intuitive than the step analysis we did, but it also spits out the answer quickly. Okay, what if, okay. Okay. Now, what about getting the time out of your this martingale method? Well, turns out here's another martingale. Your fortune's a martingale. Your fortune squared minus the number of steps you've taken since the start is a martingale. And just to prove that, you know, um, x i squared at time i plus one. Okay, one step later, what's that? Well, with probability a half, it's x i minus one squared uh, minus um, i plus one. So i steps in. Or you could win with, again, probability of half. This one, okay, this is half i minus two xi plus one half plus one These things cancel, those cancel,
We are supposed to get to that. Um, did I miss something in the algebra? So this process is just a quantity at time i. So in both cases, you know, this is i plus 1 because you've now moved to time by i plus 1. Um, Plus one, xi xi is your fortune at time i. So at time i plus one, you've either lost one or you've gained one. Yeah. Dan? Your second and fourth brackets don't cancel. Your second and fourth brackets don't cancel? Yeah. Yeah. You mean you have these minus two? Minus and minus and oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So that's plus one, and they don't cancel. Uh, we get minus i plus 1, and that is xi squared minus i. Thank you. Okay, cool. So, this thing on average is this. Okay, really I should put an expected value just to denote out average. Okay, so this makes this process of Martingale, and therefore expectation of x zero of x tau squared minus tau, where tau is the time at which we start, is going to equal to x zero squared minus zero. Okay. Well, what's x zero? It's k. Right. That's what you start with. Okay, so that's k squared. What about this side? Well, with some <coughs> probability, you're going to lose. Uh, and then you'll have 0, which is... Then you'll have 0 squared... You know, x, your fortune will be 0 if you lose. So that'll be just minus tau. Plus your property of winning, which is going to be n squared minus tau, is k squared. k and your property of losing is 1 minus your property of winning. So it's 1 minus property of winning times minus tau plus property of winning times n squared minus tau. And really I guess I want to call this e of tau now is k squared. k and a little bit of algebra. We see the same result that your expected time until winning is k times n minus k. Are there questions? Anyone? Wait, how, how do we get the expected of x? So, sorry? How do we get the expected of x? Well, we have, a, we have this thing as a martingale. Right. And that means that your expectation at this point mm -hmm. is equal to, what it, is it 0, which is k squared? Well, what is it at the end of the game? Either you've lost and it's just minus e of tau, right? Uh, and either you lose 
or you win. In which case, this thing becomes n squared minus x time. <coughs> and then we really we say probability of loss is 1 minus probability of win. We um, do algebra. Uh, things cancel with win probability. Well, we know the win probability is k over n, right? Sorry. Yeah. So, win probability is k over n. And it works out, and if you do really plug and chug algebra, I'm sure you can all handle. And we get k times n minus k. Is there good a reference for doing this, or should you just Google? Um, <laughs> Google is very helpful. Um, this is uh, usually kind of honors level sets. You guys can handle it. Um, uh, Joel, is uh, going from um, difference equations to uh, explicit formulae part of something that's uh, competition, <coughs> competition maths would require? Um, so trans, IMO. Yeah. Um, at the IMO level, this would certainly, you know, asking a question like this, aside from the fact that this one is really kind of standard, would be completely normal. Um, but yeah, ask, like here's a difference equation. Figure out what the what the formula is. Absolutely. Um, we had um, again. There was a, on Monday. Um, we were asked about the generating function approach. Uh, which also is a difference equation that you, know, you need to get asymptotics for. And yeah, it came up in camera last year. Or this year, right? This year? A difference equation. If you were there, it was question one. <laughs> question one this year's panel. What's the time? Oh, it's not this year. Yeah. The current equation. Induction works perfectly, so it's like you don't know either. Induction does work. Well, this is induction. Okay. So yeah, that is a slightly different question, but this is an induction which turns out to be a little bit messier than that one. But also, if you want to induct, you have to guess the formula. Well, that one was. Cool. Um, so we are sort of 10 minutes out of time. Um, partly because we yeah. started five minutes late because the test was 15 minutes late. Uh, been fun. Uh, see you guys next year.